And see, what's the point now whereby you can put in Robert De Niro as Gandalf, and one second later, you get an image output. So the first output of that was uh, that hit the mainstream was Dali from OpenAI. That was in April of this year. So you can say a cyber goth girl overlooking Neo Tokyo, and boom, eight seconds later, it's generated. And this is a totally yeah. unique creative image that did not exist in the world before, right? It did not exist in the world before. All the data that went into that, so it was about 600 million images, it can't recreate any of those images. Instead, it's learned the principles of that. So again, it's the principle-based analysis, which is insane, right? Before we get into what you're doing now, what the hell gave a hedge fund manager the thought process that, hey, I can help the WHO and everybody else with artificial intelligence? Well, it's because to be a hedge fund manager, you have to be a bit of an egomaniac, right? You have to believe that you're <laughs> right and everyone else is kind of wrong. Look, I mean, uh, all of what we do is information classification, and that's the nature of artificial intelligence. So information comes in, and then Claude Shannon style information theory. Information is only valuable in as much as the change in the state. So you're always looking for something on that graph or that news thing that will cause you to change from a buy to a sell or an increase or decrease in your positioning, right? I kind of realized over the years, so like my background was mathematics, computer science originally, and so quite quantitative, quite analytical, that the next wave of AI was something a bit different that would enable us to do something a bit different. Because we moved from this big data age, you know, where you had massive amounts of information and they extrapolated it and targeted it to kind of sell Raoul some suntan or whatever, you know? To something a bit different, a big model. You're jealous of my tan. Whereby you're jealous of my I'm tan. I'm jealous of your tan. I'm in <laughs> London, you're in Cayman Islands, I'm turning pasty. <laughs> Completely. Uh, I have to kind of fly out there soon. So you moved from that area where it was about extrapolation in the individual to something new in 2017, which was a big model age. AI went from being able to just do extrapolation to being able to pay attention. In fact, there was a seminal paper called Attention is All You Need about how to build an AI that paid attention to the most important parts of a sentence, the most important parts of an image, to do principle-based analysis, which is insane if you think about it. But it's exactly what we do, right? We have this heuristic. What do you, what do you mean by principle-based analysis? Sorry. So rather than doing extrapolation, so rather than doing momentum, beta, AI became able to do alpha. It became able to basically come up with principles that allowed it to understand the hidden layers of meaning with things. So we can go that into a bit more detail. But this is how the human brain works, right? We have two parts of our brain. The future is like the past, and that's a tiger over there in that bush, right? It's the type one, type two kind of thinking. So AI was always one of the extrapolation. And now we have a new type of AI that mimics the human brain by figuring out principles from highly structured data, which is kind of what we did every single day as the finance guys, right? but at a completely different scale. I don't think even now people have appreciated how big a change that's going to be to just about everything. I think we're starting to figure that out now. So before we get into the guts of this, let's go on a bit of the journey of AI, because you've talked about where it was, and then we started to see stuff like DeepMind, and then GPT-3, OpenAI, all of this. So if you can just frame it for people, because a lot of this is going to be new for people. And I think it's incredibly important people understand what's happening, the speed at which it's happening, and where the hell of this is going. Yeah. So if you look at DeepMind, um, they are famous for many things. You know, Demis has done a fantastic job. Um, one of the things they did is, thinking back, you had Gary Kasparov being beaten by Deep Blue. So, you know, us, us older fellows, we remember that. Not like the young with the who've never seen a bear market in their lives. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of changes happening. What Deep Blue did was it did an analysis of every single game in the past and then extrapolated it and then it brute forced it. So Gary could only think X moves in the future. It could think X plus two, X plus three. And that's how he got beaten by brute force. Now, the Chinese game of Go, Chinese checkers effectively, People thought you'd never be able to brute force it because there's too many things that you can do. There's too many moves on that board, right? Um, and so they're like, ah, that'll never be beaten by a computer because you need to build a computer that's the biggest computer ever times a million. What DeepMind did is that basically they came up with a self-supervised learning algorithm that learned how to dream 
<laughs> that's probably the best way to kind of put it, about how one would play Go in a principled way. So it didn't even have all the past games in its memory. It just played against itself and tried to figure out how to do this. They made a whole base of these agents with reinforcement learning that you gave it an Atari with no instructions that learned how to play Breakout and then Starcraft right. and all sorts Without of Without any things. instructions. I mean, people need to understand that. It figured it out. You put it, the computer in front of something, it just figures it out and then gets better and better. So when you see it playing Breakout, it's suddenly doing these crazy moves like that. And so Lisa Doll was like, I think, a seventh Dan in uh, Go. So he was a Magnus Carlsen of kind of Go, effectively. And it wasn't a current Magnus Carlsen type situation. It's very difficult to cheat in Go because you didn't have computers to help you, right? <laughs> We're not talking about anal probes in this one. We're talking about... <laughs> uh, yeah. Conversations going funny ways, right? So what happened is that uh, the next highest person was like a fourth Dan or something. So he's like... Federer, Carlson rolled into one that much better. I was like, never beat him. He won one game, the computer won seven. And everyone was like, holy crap, what is that? Because computer learned to play in a completely different way. And it was like, this is playing with an alien. Yeah, because it because... didn't learn past games. It, As you said, it, it learned in an entirely new way. Literally, it played against itself. It dreamt. So then it plays against itself in its memory. And then it does that again and again and again. And so within just a few weeks, it outperformed him. And then these models got better and better and smaller and smaller. We haven't seen the generalization of the models yet, but they're coming. These agents that can basically optimize when you don't even tell it the rules, which is kind of insane. Then on the other hand, you had what was known as um, foundation models, which is where this attention-based architecture came in. So in the attention thing, they were seeing where the games are. I should actually add a final thing about this, and you can see this in the AlphaGo documentary that's on YouTube if you want to see more details is that as a result of this, did Lisa Doll go and say, I'm hanging up my Go pieces and I'm going to pack them away? No. He started playing against it, and now he's even better as a player. And the entire Go competitive scene has improved because now they're figuring out brand new ways and kind of gambits and things they'd never seen before, which I think is really interesting. Then you had kind of this other kind of big area, which was kind of some of this deep learning area. We have these big corpuses, and, you know, like I said, you can do extrapolations and stuff, but you don't understand meaning. And so this is where these attention-based architectures came in. Um, it's actually quite interesting. So when I was taking a break from fund management to work with my son, um, autism is a very interesting condition. No cure, nothing to be done. So, of course, you know, you go and quit being a hedge fund manager and build a team and try to do it because egomaniacs, right? You my wife is an applied behavioral analyst who just treats kids with, kids with autism. So I live hey. that life. Exactly. So applied behavioral analysis uses variable rewards and a lot of the stuff you use in video games to rebuild words. So if you have a stroke or you have autism, you haven't basically said can, right? So the word can can mean I can, it can mean that can, it can mean the can can, lots of different things. But because there's so much noise in the brain, which is why you see a lot of kids and adults with autism not being able to handle large amounts of information. I have Asperger's myself and ADHD. They usually balance out, sometimes not quite. <laughs> um, it's very difficult to pay attention. And we all feel that. Like, you know, when your leg is tapping, there's just too much going on. That's the fugue state because there's two transmitters in the brain, GABA, which calms you down, and glutamate, which excites you. So when you pop a Valium, your GABA levels go up. And imagine if your brain was always excited for one reason or another. You wouldn't be able to concentrate and build those connections to the word can. You know, that hidden layer of meaning for what can is. Um, so, you know, that's why I repurpose drugs to adjust those levels. There's like 16 different things we identify that could potentially cause it. But because medicine treats everyone the same, it meant that one drug that made 34% of kids better made 28% of kids worse. So there's no cure and there's no treatment. So that's a different, bigger story and something, again, this AI can help with. And why is that relevant? It's because what this AI does now is exactly the same. It uses giant honking supercomputers so that if you take a terabyte of text, it learns what the most important words of the sentence are, and that's what GPT-3 was from OpenAI. It took a 1,000 gigabytes of text, and it learned how to write in any style and any extension. So it paid the most important part of any sentence. So you give it a sentence like Legolas and Gimli. That's all you give it, and it will write an entire scene in the style of Tolkien that's never been seen before. You know, you give it a sentence, and you say make it happier. It understands what happier is. And this is what's called a latent space of meaning because it takes 
Uh, that took uh, one terabyte of information, so a thousand gigabytes, and GPT-3 is about 40 gigabytes in size. But it can recreate any style of writing and it can understand any style of writing, which is, I mean, again, a bit crazy. I mean, it's it's staggering. We'll, we'll come into the societal impacts and what this all means in a bit, but just want to yeah. get through the technology. It is astonishing when you see GPT-3 because basically it writes authentic pieces that are not stolen from other things, much like the deep um, deep mind did with Go. It wasn't stealing from old games. It learned how to do it. Is that right? It learned it learned principles. It learned stars. It learned what's called the latent space, the hidden layers of meanings between different types of words. So, like, um, we just released the most advanced image version of that, Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion took a hundred thousand gigabytes so a hundred terabytes of images and we made a two gigabyte file that can do any style in any image of any type so that this is like dali right what's it's the dali on steroids so so explain dali and then we'll come into what you're doing because that, you know again i just want to get people up the knowledge graph because dali was the next big one that i stopped in my tracks and went holy shit this is amazing yeah so so gpt3 came out in 2020 and then we released the open source version of that gpt neo which i'll come back to last year there was a breakthrough in image generation so you can generate text and everyone's like image is too difficult right because a picture paints a thousand words like surely it should be a thousand times more complex nice. turns out it wasn't nice. yeah. so you had um, something called clip which basically you took any image and it'd be able to classify it. So it'd be able to say that's a Raul and that's a red sofa and all these things, understand loads of concepts because they compress that down. Then you had a generative model that took words to images. So you had two models, a word to image model and image to word model. And at the start of last year, we figured out how to bounce them off each other. So it would generate an image and then it'd check if that image was the same as the prompt and it'd go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And after 10 minutes, you generate a simulcrum of an image from the word input. So words go in, images come out. And we're like, holy crap. It looks a bit mushy, but that's insane. It can generate an image of anything, but it isn't high quality. Then what happened is that OpenAI and us accelerated that whole space because we thought it was freaking cool and put lots of research into it until you got to the point now whereby you can put in Robert De Niro as Gandalf and one second later, you get an image output. So the first output of that was... Uh, that hit the mainstream was Dali from OpenAI. That was in April of this year. So you can say a cyber goth girl overlooking near Tokyo, and boom, eight seconds later, it's generated. And this is a totally yeah. unique creative image that did not exist in the world before, right? It did not exist in the world before. All the data that went into that, so it was about 600 million images, it can't recreate any of those images. Instead, it's learned the principles of that. So again, it's the principle-based analysis, which is insane, right? Um, because it's like, again, it's the heuristic stuff that we do all the time. And it can combine different concepts. So you can say a Van Gogh by Banksy, and it will do a Van Gogh by Banksy, or kind of do Scream. And now there's more and more technologies that have emerged from that. So OpenAI kind of uh, announced the closed beta of that. And then my company, Stability AI, created a version that was 30 times faster and more powerful. So tell me about Stability AI. When did it start? Who's involved? What are you guys doing? Yeah, so it started in 2020. Um, we well, technically started in 2019 with the education work, but I can talk about that later. But 2020 is when it was formed officially to do the COVID work. So it's lead the UN COVID initiative, launched at Stanford, etc. So you founded um, this? So that, I founded it, yeah. Nice. Because someone needed to build something to do AI as a public good. So I didn't exactly know what the business model was or anything like that then. I just thought, someone needs to build this stuff because people are dying, effectively. And then we had the other project. So actually, I'll mention it. So my co-founder and I, so Joe's uh, runs the charitable arm, we have took the Global X Prize for Learning. So that was a $15 million prize funded by Elon Musk and Tony Robbins for the first app that could teach literacy and numeracy in 18 months without internet. And we've been deploying it in refugee camps and low-income areas around the world to the point where now we are teaching kids literacy and numeracy in 13 months and one hour a day in a refugee camp in Malawi. And we just got the remit to educate every child in Malawi, 3.9 million kids, with a completely 
open book of hardware, software, deployment, and curriculum. So we're going to invite the world to say, let's build an open source education system where the AI teaches the kids and the kids teach the AI. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.